stopping. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is April Wepler. I am the Engagement Coordinator at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. And our webinar today is the third in our four-part series titled, Where is the Protection? Discussing the Review and Reform of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or SEPA. And SEPA regulates a broad range of things in Canada, from the most dangerous pollutants to plastic manufactured items to genetically engineered animals. In today's webinar, we are talking about SEPA and Indigenous peoples' rights. We'll discuss the importance of cooperation and consultation with Indigenous people, how Indigenous communities are impacted by pollution and chemicals, and the connections between the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the review of SEPA. And if you missed it, the first two webinars from the series are available on CELA's website on the same event page where you registered for today's webinar. And we'll share that link in the chat box in just a moment. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm calling in today from Guelph, um, where I'm on the traditional lands of Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. And I'll start by telling you a little bit about the Canadian Environmental Law Association. CELA is a specialty legal aid clinic within the Ontario-wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. We work to protect human health and our environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change policies to prevent those problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low-income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who receive less of a say in decision-making. And we're pleased today to be co-hosting our session with Nature Canada, one of the oldest national nature conservation charities in Canada. For 80 years, Nature Canada has helped protect over 110 million acres of parks and wildlife areas in Canada and countless species. Today, Nature Canada represents a network of over 100,000 members and supporters and more than 800 nature organizations. Nature Canada is engaging in the modernization of SEPA in order to protect the genetic integrity of wild species and ecosystems and to ensure that Indigenous peoples' rights are respected. A quick bit of housekeeping, a reminder to please keep your microphones muted during the session so we don't have issues with background noise. We are recording the session today and we'll share the link as well as any slide decks via email with all registered participants. Should you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put those in the chat box at any time and we'll address them during the Q&A at the end of the session. You're also welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box now to share a land acknowledgement if you would like. Uh, it'd be lovely to get a sense of who's on the line with us today. And while we're on the topic of the chat box, I would offer uh, a gentle suggestion or a friendly reminder to encourage us to approach today's conversation with respect, gratitude, and curiosity and openness to different perspectives. I'm aware that there are people on the line with us today, be it staff or speakers or participants, who have lived experience with the very real impacts of pollution, chemicals, and toxics in their communities, and I'm grateful for their bravery in bringing their experiences and stories to share with us today. I look forward to learning from them and commit to doing so with respect, curiosity, and gratitude. On the line with us today, we have some folks from CELA, including myself, um, researcher and paralegal Faye DeLeon, Joseph Castrilli, who is counsel with CELA, and Zoe St. Pierre, our current articling student, who is also helping out with our tech today. From Nature Canada, we have Mark Butler, Senior Advisor and Lead on this work for Nature Canada, and Hugh Benavides, Advisor to Nature Canada on SEPA reform. And you'll likely hear from many of them during the discussion portion at the end of the webinar. For our speakers today, we are pleased to welcome Senator Mary Jane McCollum, Member of Senate Committee on Energy, Environment and Natural Resources, Joshua McNeely, Director of Environment, Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, Mike Perry from National Métis Council, and Sylvia Plain, from Great Lakes Canoe Journey and Amjanong First Nation. And I'll be introducing each of our speakers just before they present. And in the interest of ensuring the maximum amount of time for our panelists' important words today, I'm going to be skipping our usual opening polls, but I would ask that you please take a moment to fill out our survey at the end of the webinar so we can capture some of that information. And with that, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Mary Jane McCollum. Senator McCollum is a Cree woman from the Barren Lands First Nation in Brochet, Manitoba. She attended the Guy Hill Residential School from 1957 to 1968. Senator McCollum spent nearly five decades providing care to First Nations in Manitoba as a dental nurse, dental therapist, and dentist. 
In 2017, Senator McCollum was appointed to the Senate of Canada as a representative of Manitoba. She assumed this mantle with reconciliation top of mind, recognizing its importance for Canada if we are to be recognized as human rights leaders. Senator McCollum often speaks to diverse groups about residential schools. She believes that Canada must never forget the genocide of their original peoples and that lateral and vertical violence against Indigenous people persists today, a result of sustained governmental policies. In recognizing and reclaiming autonomy, she believes that Indigenous peoples are well on the journey towards reclaiming spirit and power. Senator McCollum, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll pass the microphone over to you now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm going to start this session with um, a prayer. And it is a prayer of gratitude. So I'm glad you brought that up because that um, gratitude has always been part of um, First Nations and other Indigenous cultures and that it is a way of life for them. Kitsimanitu kinanaskomitn. Kinanaskomitn idomstay median. Igaskitayan and nuts ki tom to one skyan. Ki tom igaskitayan tapagita tamuyan. Ki tom to a patamana skinny pig osti. Ki sick. You got a wapamago with no wapagapi mama wapitik. Kinanasco mitten. Quas igaskitayan tamam to need it taman. Tawapian tapitaman. Tayamian. Tayamiyan, Iwasti Goyasi Gaski Tayan, Tapachitayan Titia, Iwastin Skata. Kitsiman to Piwitap Minana Nuts, Tapita Uyak, Tawichi Yak, Takskidi Tamak Tawichi Suyak, Iwa Koyesta to Tamak Mutataski Rina. Creator, thank you for the abundance you have given me, for the privilege of waking another day, for drawing breath once again, for the ability to see once again the, the earth, sky, water, and for the to see the people that are gathered here with us today. Thank you for all that you have given me, the ability to think critically, to see, to hear, to speak, to pray and for the full mobility of my arms and legs. Creator, come and sit with us today to hear us, to help us, but also for us to understand that we help ourselves. Thank you. Can I ask you now? So I just wanted to start with that, with that um, attitude of um, gratitude of being thankful for what we have, because um, it makes me really recognize that I need to to fight for the same for people that have been disadvantaged. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge all the work that has been done by First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and non-status people in their fight against environmental degradation. I want to acknowledge that my work on environmental issues has been built through their effort. They have guided me in my push towards an improved level of environmental stewardship. I need to acknowledge our ancestors that were persistent, they were determined that we would not be left with where the government wanted us to be and that they built this for us, this to the extent that we are where we are today and that we will do the same thing as living ancestors. We will continue this fight and that um, for the generations yet to come. I want to specifically acknowledge the Tasquia Cree Nation and Snunumuk First Nation from, uh, the Tasquia is from Manitoba, Snunumuk from, uh, their land base outside of Nanaimo in BC for sharing their indigenous knowledge and for their tireless work. I want to acknowledge our allies for all the work you have done and will continue to do 
I want to especially thank Sila, Nature Canada, Eco Justice, Environmental Defence, David Suzuki Foundation, and the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment for all your advocacy and for informing informer informing the work we do. Environmental protection is an issue that has arisen in response to the destruction that has occurred to our habitats over the years. This, this destruction has contributed to the contamination and poor health of our land, air, water, biodiversity, ecosystems, the animals, birds, fish, flora, who are our relatives, and of course, our people. This destruction has been allowed to happen through land dispossession, violation of human and animal rights, and violation of environmental rights of all creation, including Mother Earth. This was all done because of the pervasive, ever-increasing, quote, development activities driven by greed. As we have seen, this greed is driven by profit, a profit which is not shared equitably with the communities whose resources have been plundered and whose people have been left to suffer with the fallout. This has resulted in the creation of vulnerable environments wherein the environment is no longer able to adequately protect the web of life. It is vulnerable because the environment, once healthy, thriving, and self-sustaining, can no longer do the work it used to in cleaning up contaminations. This is because the environment is overwhelmed with toxicity and destruction of habitat through the negative cumulative impacts of resource extraction. This vulnerable environment has in turn made people vulnerable to the extent that there have been increases in premature mortality and morbidity. The negative impacts on social and political determinants of health in this vulnerable environment continue to produce vulnerable people. When legislation does not take a whole systems approach to addressing the carnage that is occurring, but rather does so through piecemeal and siloed legislation, these policies will continue to be unable to complete the timely, fulsome work needed to decontaminate and mitigate environmental degradation. How then can we identify the greatest contributors to environmental contamination and their potential cumulative effects? Without addressing this in a responsible and comprehensive way, legislators are left in a severe deficit. And as a result, the legislation continues to oppress rather than resolve. What about other legislation that impacts both environment and lives of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and non-status peoples? People continue to claim that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was passed into law, but that is not the case. What was passed was merely an action plan to begin consultation into how the principles of UNDRIP can begin to be incorporated into Canadian law. Sorry. With this fact, industry continues to win because of the continued lack of free prior and informed consent, which is the right of the people who are impacted by resource extractive activities occurring in their area. Passive legislation like the recently adopted UNDRIP law continues to put people, animals, and the environment at a disadvantage because of the powerlessness it produces. Are we then, as legislators, producing and introducing poverty in its many varied forms? When looking specifically at SEPA legislation, and at Bill S-5, which is currently before the House of Commons, there leaves much to be desired. While Bill C S-5 was before the Senate earlier this week, year, I had made a number of amendments to the bill, including adding reference to the term vulnerable environment. But I have been advised there's some concern around this term in the House of Commons. Um, I realize my 10 minutes may be up, so I'm just going to look at. Um, You're uh, fine, Senator, you still have time. Okay, 
This concern springs from an overwhelming hesitation on the part of government to acknowledge the need for a greater scope on environmental issues. Following that requisite acknowledgement comes the need to introduce new terms and concepts into legislation to ensure these laws are better suited to be responsive and effective when combating the many threats that exist in our environment. However, the House of Commons feels that because vulnerable environment is not currently defined in federal law, that is grounds enough to defeat the amendment. It should be further should further be noted that important concepts like environmental and geographic racism, which we know exist, are also concepts that the government is reluct reluctant to enshrine into law and address accordingly. When it comes to the law itself, do I feel that CEPA and Bill S-5 will address the myriad of issues brought forward through the pre-study undertaken by the Senate Committee on Energy Environment and Natural Resources, of which I am a member? No, I do not. When we look at the last 20 plus years since CEPA 1999 passed, the destruction resulting from resource extraction and develop, development has only continued to increase. So where has this protection been and who exactly has benefited from it? There much, remains much work to be done in ensuring our lands, waters and air remain healthy and free from threat. In the absence of the proper steps being taken, how then can we believe that we have the right to a healthy environment? And how did we become a people who need protection when we were once sovereign, healthy nations? These are the questions I continue to grapple with. There, these are also the underlying issues that I constantly probe as I work within the Senate to ensure a better, healthier world will be left behind for my children, my grandchildren, and the seven generations that are to follow. And I know that the people listening in today have that same con, you know, they have that same belief, that same determination that we are going to, we are all here to work together, and that is what we're going to do. So thank you for all the work you do. Thank you so much, Senator McCollum, for that informative presentation and for your words. Appreciate that. I would like now to introduce Joshua McNeely. Zoe, if you want to go ahead and put Joshua's slides up. Joshua McNeely is a biologist from Nova Scotia who has spent the past 16 years working on a myriad of environmental issues with the goal of advancing the engagement and participation of Indigenous peoples. He helped to establish the Maritime Aboriginal Aquatic Resources Secretariat, which is one of the first and largest Aboriginal aquatic resources and oceans management bodies in Canada. He also established the Aganadi Get Environmental Education Charity, where he still serves as Executive Director. Joshua was tapped by the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples in 2022 to establish its National Environmental Directorate, bringing grassroots environmental advocacy to the national and international policy work of CAP. He has served as a member of the Chemical Management Plan Stakeholder Advisory Council and continues to serve on the Development and Review Working Group for the Canadian Ambient Air Quality Standards and as a member of the Canadian Delegations to the Convention on Biological Diversity and United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Joshua also serves on the newly established Environment and Climate Change Canada Ministerial Nature Advisory Committee. Joshua advocates for the large population of Indigenous persons who continue on their traditional ancestral homelands off reserve, now nested within Canada. In addition to Indigenous people's rights to their lands, territories and resources, including the conservation and development of those, Indigenous peoples who practice various aspects of traditional lifestyles carry with them traditional knowledge and an ecocentric worldview which if acknowledged could help guide humanity to the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Grateful to Joshua for joining us today and I will pass the microphone over to you. Okay, thank you, April. And uh, I hope you can hear me good. Can you hear me, April? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, we can hear you just fine, Joshua. Okay, good. <laughs> I've had a lot of uh, audio issues and I, I got really concerned really, really quick right there. All right. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. And um, uh, first, I want to say uh, thanks to uh, Sila and uh, Nature Canada for inviting me to this panel. And uh, thank you to the other panelists. And especially a, a, a very much thank you to uh, Senator McCollum for uh, for the opening prayer and her strong words. Um, and to all those uh, else on the, the webinar uh, who are interested in, in trying to wrap our heads around uh, SEPA, uh, S5, and Indigenous Peoples' Rights, uh, it is an immensely broad topic because Indigenous peoples' rights are uh, inherently linked to a uh, safe, clean, healthy, and uh, sustainable environment. Uh, next, please. Uh, a reference uh, to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or, or UNDRIP, um, uh, even in the preamble of an act, uh, in my mind, uh, carries with it a lot of promises. Uh, because those rights uh, constitute uh, the minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of, of Indigenous peoples. And I really like the Senate's addition uh, to S5 to include the term uh, free prior informed consent. Uh, consent is one of the most powerful expressions of self-determination. And I'm also interested in this uh, other uh, clause that uh, refers to this uh, new right to uh, a healthy environment. Uh, next, please. Uh, I want to use some UN language to try to draw these things together. Uh, I want to premise all of this by saying that I'm, I'm not a lawyer or an expert uh, in international law. However, I've been told uh, by many that uh, you know the written law is just a snapshot in time of a, of a much larger societal conversation, uh, one that is meant to be you know open and transparent, you know accessible, uh, plain language uh, that um, all who take the time to read and, and converse like we are d to doing today uh, would be able to uh, to understand. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there are, are several shortcomings, as uh, the senator noted uh, earlier, that uh, you know the S5 uh, uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, so I, I won't go through any of those. But I just wanted to draw uh, quickly a uh, uh, point to this book here by uh, uh, Dr. David Boyd. Uh, Dr. David Boyd is a, a professor at UBC, and, and he has advised the government on environmental rights, and, and he is also the current UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Um, in, the, in here, he looked at the, uh, the constitutions, laws, uh, legal processes from around the world and compared what uh, was written down to how well states actually protected their environments and the human rights of their citizens. Uh, not surprisingly, he found many instances where just because it's written down uh, doesn't make it so. But also, he, he found uh, many instances where the, the opposite was true. Um, where there is a deliberate implementation of what was available in legislation and policy, um, uh, that uh, in some cases those could uh, give rise in effect to uh, uh, the protection of, of environment and human rights uh, in many countries, uh, even where those rights aren't, uh, aren't well articulated on paper. So I'm involved uh, in the work of the UN because uh, I see the UN as being vital, uh, especially for indigenous peoples to articulate fundamental human rights, as well as investigating rights violations and holding states accountable. Um, also, the nature by which international law comes about is one of, of consensus among states, uh, or at least that the UN member states uh, has a, have a general goals of, of protecting the dignity and worth of the human person and, and reaffirming faith in fundamental human rights. So, for example, uh, in 2007, when Canada voted no on the adoption of UNDRIP, uh, there was considerable pressures both within Canada and internationally for Canada to comply uh, with the, the declaration because uh, those human rights expressed uh, within were, were already generally accepted uh, long before uh, UNDRIP. Uh, next, please. So at the international level, uh, several documents uh, have adopted uh, 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 the in have drawn uh, linkages, I should say, between uh, the, the protection of the environment and the uh, protection of human rights, such as uh, the UN General Re uh, Assembly resolution that was passed uh, this past August, 
um, this year, and uh, the UN Human Rights Council resolution uh, was passed last year, both of which recognize that clean, healthy, and sustainable environments are fundamental human rights. Um, uh, those would be resolution 76300 and, and, and 4813. Uh, here we see that uh, the, the two sides of, of what I believe to be complementary rights, uh, one that protecting the environment ensures the avail availability of all other human rights, and two, it is through exercising human rights that we are able to protect the environment. With S5, um, uh, we have what I believe to be at least a, a, a tenuous link between the protection of human rights and the protection of the environment uh, via these references to UNDRIP and this uh, right to a healthy environment. However, I'd like to see the recognition more explicit uh, like as in the UN General uh, Assembly resolution, which incidentally Canada did vote yes on. Um, but working with what we have currently, uh, uh, in, in S5, you know, UNDRIP does contain numerous articles uh, declaring indigenous peoples uh, rights to lands, territories, and resources, including which includes the protection and sustainable development of those. I believe the protection of, of our rights is best done by indigenous peoples themselves through our own representatives and, and institutions. Essentially, uh, the control of or having control over lands, territories, and resources by indigenous peoples supports the development of in indigenous institutions, uh, which in turn express and protect indigenous peoples' rights. Uh, an indigenous people's ecocentric worldview of interconnectedness and interdependency within our, our natural our natural world uh, requires that our our own expressions of, uh, of of our human rights correspond directly or, or even indistinguishably with uh, environmental rights. Next, please. And by environmental rights, I'm not simply talking about a human right to a healthy environment. I also mean the concept uh, existing in, in many indigenous people's customary laws that the environment or Mother Earth uh, also has inalienable rights, which must be respected. While UNDRIP does not contain any recognition of rights to Mother Earth, indigenous peoples themselves have adopted uh, such a declaration, as, as uh, shown here. You know, just as human beings as, have human rights, all other beings also have rights which are specific to their species or kind and appropriate for their role and function within the communities within which they exist. The rights of each are limited by the rights of other beings and any conflict between their rights must be resolved in a way that maintains the integrity, balance, and the, the health of uh, Mother Earth. Next, please. But at least uh, the link between UNDRIP and uh, the right to a healthy environment is clearly drawn by the UN Special Rapporteur, who laid out uh, 16 framework principles for uh, interpreting this right. Uh, here we see framework principle 15, which calls for recognizing and protecting indigenous people's rights to lands, territories, and resources, uh, free prior informed consent or FPIC, uh, protection of traditional knowledge, and practices and uh, fair and equitable benefit sharing. Uh, anyone familiar with uh, UNDRIP uh, would immediately note that these are the preconditions for self-determination. I would also note that uh, the recognition of indigenous people's rights to self-determination, uh, rights to lands, territories, and resources, and granting and withholding uh, FPIC uh, were the very things that Canada opposed at the time of the adoption of, of UNDRIPS. Next, please. Uh, this slide is just to show that there are several other international organizations that have also grasped the importance of linking Indigenous peoples' rights uh, to environmental protection. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I have the time uh, to, to you know, go through examples of the adversarial nature uh, of Canada towards Indigenous peoples regarding recognition of, of rights to lands, territories, and resources. I mean, I'd like to talk uh, a lot about the, the situation of Mi'kmaq fisheries in the East, uh, but I'm sure that we can all uh, recall some recent examples of land and water defenders and, and, and rights defenders. Uh, so next, please. 
Uh, I'll end here on, uh, with my last slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, I really like the inclusion uh, in uh, S5 uh, by the Senate to use the term free prior informed consent um, because it, it is a vital expression of, of self-determination. Uh, here I've tried to uh, briefly summarize a few points from uh, FAO, that's the, the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, on, on their definition uh, uh, of FPIC, which is actually a, a whole manual on FPIC, uh, if anybody's interested in, in, in downloading that. But um, free means uh, that you know not only the consent uh, uh, is to be free of coercion, but the process by which uh, consent is arrived at must also be free of expectations, short timelines, and, and other conditions imposed by uh, the, the uh, entity which is seeking consent. Uh, prior means that the timeline to provide consent is determined by Indigenous peoples, and that the information provided to Indigenous peoples must be at the earliest possible stages to comply with those timelines. Uh, this may even mean information shared at the conceptualization or financing stages, as well as through a project's life cycle. Informed, uh, you know, means not only that the, the description of the activities to be com or to be complete and accurate about their size, scope, pace, impact, duration, uh, whatever else, uh, but it also uh, must be delivered in a manner that is accessible and, and understandable to Indigenous peoples, including language considerations. You know, for example, engineered drawings may be excellent, but they're inadequate to an indigenous organization which uh, doesn't employ an engineer uh, who can interpret those drawings or engage with the project engineers. Um, also, considering the process by which indigenous peoples arrive at consensus, uh, other culturally appropriate means may be required to uh, directly inform uh, community members. And uh, as I said, uh, consent is one of the most powerful expressions of self-determination. Therefore, you know, indigenous peoples uh, need to retain full control of the extent to their consent, you know, to give it, to withhold it, or to give it with consideration, with uh, conditions. Um, consent is also an, an ongoing process, which is influenced by a wide variety of, of other environmental, social, economic, and, and, and political fa uh, factors. Uh, and indigenous peoples retain the right to revoke or, or modify their consent at any time. I feel that we haven't really even scratched the surface on uh, on FPIC uh, for the protection of the environment, but I am I'm glad to see that it is included in S5. Um, as I said earlier, uh, S5 uh, sort of kicks uh, the definition of the right to a healthy environment down the road. Also, you know, the UNDRIP Act itself uh, is fairly sparse, as uh, the senator noted. Uh, that leaves a lot to be uh, uh, to, to be done, uh, and, and, and a lot is kicked down the road to this implementation plan. So, um, you know, there's going to be a, a need for a lot of discussion over the next uh, few years uh, to try to put some uh, some meat on these on these bones that uh, that we do have here. Um, and uh, so, thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to uh, our, our panel discussion. Uh, well, Eliok. Thank you very much, Joshua. Appreciate that presentation. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce Sylvia Plain from Amgenong First Nation. Sylvia is the owner and operator of the Great Lakes Canoe Journey Education Program, which was founded in 2014. Sylvia has been a research and policy analyst in the environment sector for 10 years, working for First Nations communities and political organizations in Ontario. In 2022, Sylvia attended the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Geneva, Switzerland. And Sylvia is a member of the First Nations Advisory Council at the Ontario Clean Water Agency and serves on the Board of Directors for Rezo Centre for Mobilizing Innovation. Thank you for joining us, Sylvia, and I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you. So uh, I hate writing bios and I hate hearing them, so. <laughs> Um, anyways, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have uh, 12 minutes with you, I believe. So I'm going to try and jam in some, a lot of stuff, but uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, some, so I'm from Amjanung and that is, in itself is, is a very long conversation, uh, but to, for people that aren't aware of it, but so Amjanung uh, are traditional territories, first place is strike oil in Canada. Um, we're on a waterway to open up to, you know, before railroads, uh, we had the waterway to go out to the Northwest, you can go out to the Atlantic, 
Um, so we're pretty central to a lot of things, transportation, movement of, of you know, oil, and, and now we're connected by pipes, uh, and we're a major uh, refining hub for, for Canada. So very important. Omjanong is on one of the old Canadian dollar bills. We're tucked in behind all of the smokestacks and whatnot, but we're there. <laughs> so we're, we're a big part of, of uh, Canadian history, uh, the Canadian economy uh, since the beginning up until right now. Unfortunately, the implications of that are uh, 63 petrochemical plants that surround my community and the river, St. Clair River, is on the western bounds of, of our, our territory. But we also signed the Treaty of Detroit and our territory goes up to almost Goderich, uh, to almost like Guelph, down to Windsor. So uh, when Omjanong thinks of Omjanong, we think about our, our traditional territories. And so, but unfortunately, we've been boxed in uh, Awful land plan, land use planning. <laughs> uh, if you if you ever get the opportunity to visit Omjanong, see it, you know everything's wrong. Whoever made the choices to to put us in there. So there's a lot of human rights violations uh, through the the pollution emittance, and and um, so as a as a citizen of Omjanong. It, it that defines my work um, and how I attempt to make a difference uh, for our community. But as an Anishinaabe person, thinking about uh, the Anishinaabe people and our much lar larger territories as well, too. So, so a lot to think about. Um, but in particular, the reason why I'm on this panel and why SEPA is important is because of those human rights violations because of the pollution and the types of uh, chemicals that are being emitted in the, the large amounts, the lack of accountability, the lack of fines. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of issues. And so I guess today, you know, with that backdrop kind of set is just to kind of say, as a citizen, these are my attempts to, I've been looking around, I've worked for different organizations. I was at the University of Toronto uh, and I serve on different boards. And so I try to, I try to look around and I see who's being effective, who's good to work with, where can we make a difference? And um, so at, at the current moment, um, yeah, so I run uh, the Great Lakes Community Journey Education Program. It sounds fun and it is great. And so what really what we're doing is planting seeds in our younger generation of people, First Nations youth, uh, well, all ages, we're, we're an all ages program, but really it's about mobilizing uh, community-based people to be contributors to our communities. And so through building capacity, uh, providing skill sets through canoe building and indigenous technology, um, we're in it for the long run. We're going to create a new generation of people that uh, are land defenders, land protectors, guardians, um, and uh, but really that was a that project came out of a research question when I was working with Dr. Deb McGregor, um, and and really I kind of went with that. I'm a baseball player. I went with that. If you build it, they will come. Kind of thing. So, and drew inspiration from our West Coast tribe. So. Um, really love their land management, their workout in the West Coast, that governance of a very large body of water, the Pacific, we're Great Lakes people. Um, and, and also having that tremendous responsibility for, for caring. I mean, we were always the first order of government, but, you know, with the extractions, pollutions, invasive species, recreation, sports, all of those things, like, and being the largest source of, of fresh drinking water, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. We have a lot on our plate um, as Indigenous people. So, um, and we're always thinking about that. And um, so, so, so that's what I think about. I think about Amjanang, I think about the Great Lakes, I think about my people, and then thinking about, you know, this is, this is Mother Earth, our, our roles and responsibilities. It doesn't matter who lives here. It's thinking about everyone and, and trying to sustain ourselves for the future. And so that education program is a is a is a community based. Uh, it's a movement. I say we're kind of in this artistic uh, kind of revolution through the arts and interacting with the land. And so that also, you know, introduces, you know, through the canoe work. I'm also a knowledge keeper, so someone that operationalizes indigenous knowledge. Um, and so being among that uh, pool of people that are Indigenous knowledge keepers that who are our scientists. Um, and so working with 
all of those people that don't have formal education, or maybe we do, like myself, um, but going back to the community and, and being those people that are leaders and are, are science tables and government, when they come to us, are you using the land? How do you operate it? How, can you articulate the language and show that it's even valid in comparison to Western science? We're demonstrating that it's it's better that we are doing it. Um, we're uh, educating a, a younger generation of people uh, how to return back to our indigenous classrooms and to, into the land. And so, so through that, um, you know, so I, I work with a lot of trees. I harvest a lot. So seeing the impacts of invasive species in our particular territories, climate change. So affecting our, our artists and our and our, the, their our livelihood for, um, for, you know, means of living or our traditional economy. So, so there's so there's a lot. So I'm engaging on on many different levels and 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 so the the stuff that I also enjoy. So that's my land based work, but. Um, you know, working in, in policy and, and research. Um, you know, I'm really proud to sit on the boards thinking about drinking water. We still haven't been able to achieve that as a developed country. That's something we should be ashamed of. Um, again, these are all violations of, of human rights. And, you know, we're unfortunate when, it, when we're talking about indigenous rights and we're talking about SIPA, it's just like human rights matter more. If it's in the context to indigenous peoples, it's like we don't really matter. And and Amjanong is is an example of that. And, and you know, one of the things that, and really appreciate, uh, I, I think it was Josh that talked a lot about the UN reports, because that's getting in that direction to explain, starting in 2016, after kind of looking around, um, you know, what's being effective, finally being able to go to participating in the permanent forum on the rights of Indigenous people um, in New York. I was able to co-chair the World Indigenous People's Caucus. So I was trying to squeeze in wherever we can, uh, advocating for Amjanung and, and any resource extraction projects that are affecting Anishinaabek communities or Ontario communities, um, utilizing those avenues and those mechanisms. So, I, so today, I guess, then leaving in a message really wanting to encourage looking at some of those special repertoire reports. So Boyd uh, had a report with uh, uh, Marcos uh, Orellana and, and uh, in 2022, uh, Baskot uh, Tunzik. These really great referencing in terms of academic research, looking around, doing a comparative analysis. So there's really great things that are really great recommendations, really great reports that I think that could be included into SEPA. And so that's been my uh, approach is because I have those opportunities to participate internationally um, going there. So 2016, that was the first time. And because of that, that triggered the special repertoire. Uh, they visited many communities uh, throughout Canada, Indigenous communities, because we use these avenues to go and report what's going on in Canada because they're not entirely accurate by by the countries when they're going and so so these these avenues are really really great for us and then fast forward to this year going to the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous people and and engaging you know I was able to have an audience with the deputy uh, Canadian ambassador in Geneva uh, being able to sit with some of the experts on the appointed expert member council um, and and in saying like we don't our our human rights are being violated uh you know we can't even focus on these other things because we can't we don't have the right to clean air in in Amjanong and and literally in one of the reports Amjanong is called a sacrifice zone that's a cold war era uh term coined and that's describing a modern day developed Canada that's another thing that we should be ashamed of but unfortunately Amjanong in many indigenous communities are classified in that report as sacrifice zones. We're literally just, they don't want us, anybody to know that we're there. They don't wanna know what's going on. Cancer is becoming extremely prominent. We have a birth rate ratio, two girls being born to one boy. Uh, you know, the fetuses are pre-polluted. And what what is SIPA doing? There's, there's no rights. There's nobody has rights in there. Businesses have rights government protecting themselves and whatever they want to achieve those those are the people who have rights so this is really kind of 
just me stating asking for help like this is an opportunity do we want to look back when we review SEPA and say we were told what we could have done and we didn't do anything or do we want to be a generation of people to say that we were we heard we looked around we feel it we're in the state of emergency right now the environment is look at COVID it's telling us like the environment needs to chill out. We need to step, you know, change things. And and we're in a place right now. We have opportunity through the CEPA review, and and uh, to to change things. To think about Indigenous people. We're we're a like I said, we're another order of government. We're another level of protection. And uh, so this is a real opportunity. Um, but really, I wanted to just show, demonstrate at least what one individual, number one. Please think about Omjanung and and everything that's there. Find the find the the companies. Don't think about them. Think about us and what we're contributing to this country. What we can do for the environment. Not what are you going to get out of it. What can you squeeze before we're a sacri We're completely sacrificed. <laughs> you know, we we can do better. And and so, but just also demonstrating that these are the avenues that, um, at least for myself. And having support from Omjanung, I don't speak for Omjanung. We have a really excellent environment coordinator committee, um, but uh, this is it's a an individual effort of of what we can do utilizing these other mechanisms. Because I've been looking around, and we have really great people in Omjanung, in our organizations that are in working with the province, working with NGOs, working with the federal government, all of these really great things. And so this is just for me saying, this is where I'm going because these doors um, open up. So um, yeah, and then I guess just most updated, yeah, because of those efforts through 2016 going this July, uh, have been appointed and currently working on uh, United Nations resolutions, uh, both for the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council as well as the Organization of American States. So, and, and these are resolutions pertaining to Indigenous rights. So uh, very proud to be able to squeeze in there, to be able to advocate for Omjanung, for Indigenous peoples. Um, and these are the efforts in, in collaborating. So learning how to work with Canadian officials in different apart departments, like Global Affairs, maybe CERNAC. Um, so appreciative. So, you know, there is some opportunities. I'm, I'm grateful to, to those efforts for the resolutions committee. Um, but, uh, but SIPA is the main focus. And I hope that through all the testimonies, the reports, these events like this, that, that people are listening, that really hear that, that this is the opportunity for us to change and, and, and looking 20 years ahead, we can be proud of ourselves and, and, and tackle new issues because we tackled right now. Let's tackle new things. Let's tackle whatever. Look what we've fixed. Look what we've done. Look what we've improved and, and work on that. Um, so, so I'm optimistic. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening. Uh, it was a lot to squeeze in. But um, yeah, please check out my program. And um, thanks for everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And well said. I think we just need to take that sound clip and play it for the committee. Let's not be talking about this again in 20 years. Let's be fixing something else. That's very well said. Thank you. All right, so I am now pleased to introduce Mike Perry. And Mike comes from the Métis Nation of Ontario where he previously served as lead uh, laws and constitution for self-government. A practicing lawyer and social worker, Mike clerked for the Supreme Court of the Northwest Territories and holds a master's degree in law from Duke University. Mike also teaches law at Trent University and is an alumnus of the Public Leadership Program at Harvard. Mike was formerly coordinator of Canada's campaign for the International Criminal Court and a past member of the Canadian Armed Forces Reserves. Mike's family line roots back to Red River via the historic Métis community at Georgian Bay. He lives in the traditional territory of the Michisagi Anishinaabek, known today as Kawartha Lakes, Ontario, with his two children, Abigail and Gabe. So we can now pass the mic over to Mike. I didn't do that on purpose. Sorry, Mike. Thanks, April. I'll, I'll take the mic. And Tanshi, uh, everyone, Kia, wow. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm very honored and humbled to be part of this, uh, this panel discussion and to be uh, able to, to speak with you all. 
Um, I am uh, broadcasting live here from the traditional territories of the Michisagi and Nishnebeg, as, uh, as April mentioned, to Kawartha Lakes, which is just north of Toronto. And uh, as, as I start out, because I am legal advisor of the Métis National Council, I preface my remarks by saying that uh, I'm here in my unofficial capacity. And so the uh, remarks I make may or may not reflect policy of the Métis National Council. And uh, I wanna start, of course, by acknowledging um, uh, Senator McCallum and Sylvia's uh, firsthand experience and, and the wisdom that they've uh, expressed and, and say, uh, uh, Marseille, thank you, uh, merci for that. Um, and to all of the, the speakers and, and people who have joined, who'll be sharing their knowledge and expertise uh, in the chat. I realize I have the poll position here right now. I am the only panelist standing between uh, us right now <coughs> and the discussion. And I know we're all looking forward to having a great discussion uh, and learning together. So I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, I was really thankful to Sila and to Nature Canada. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today um, in the context of, of S5. Uh, but really what I'll be talking about and using this opportunity for is to pr provide um, some education and awareness as to uh, the status of UNDRIP implementation and we're linking that specifically to, uh, to Bill S5. Um, so as I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone on the call, the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, uh, came, uh, came out of obviously the United Nations, uh, Canada, uh, says that it uh, endorsed, or shall we say, removed its objection to initial objection to um, UNDRIP uh, back in 2016, and has since then undertaken efforts to implement its obligations, its international obligations under UNDRIP into national uh, Canadian law. That being the UNDRIP Implementation Act, which was passed by Parliament and received royal assent and came into force in effect in June of 2021. So uh, just last June, a year ago, June. And um, part of what the, the UNDRIP Implementation Act does two things. It's kind of a, you know, for, you know to, to oversimplify it. One, it says, all right, we're going to create an action plan for implementing our obligations under UNDRIP. And how will we do that uh, moving forward? The second track is a commitment under Section 5, which I'll be talking about very briefly uh, this afternoon. Section 5, which you'll see on the screen, commits uh, as a statutory duty now, the Government of Canada must, you must not may, for those lawyers in the crowd, must, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, take all measures necessary to ensure the laws of Canada are consistent with the Declaration, meaning the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And a few things come to mind there. One, it's a, an obligation on the government of Canada, not Indigenous peoples, to ensure that Canada's laws apply. Of course, you know, the Métis Nation stands ready to help and assist and to be partners in, in that canoe on this journey. Um, however, it comes back to a duty upon Canada, a legislative statutory duty. Um, and it's to be done to, to ensure that the laws are, are, are consistent with UNDRIP, it has to consult and cooperate with Indigenous peoples. And uh, as was mentioned around free prior and informed consent, um, for the Métis Nation, we see consultation and cooperation as really the mechanism to get to free prior and informed consent on measures to uh, legislative measures by Canada to ensure they're consistent with the declaration. Uh, very important because it's governments uh, and representative bodies of Indigenous peoples that can provide free prior and informed consent. So in an exercise here in statutory interpretation, the words consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. What is that and what does that look like? Well, as I said, this is a journey that we're all in together, uh, Indigenous peoples and the government of Canada, in terms of what does that look like? What does consultation and cooperation look like, not just in an abstract sense, but to rise to the level of discharging this statutory duty now under, the, under Section 5 of the UNDRIP Implementation Act? There has been, and a lot of times it's interna international instrument, instruments or international law, 
kind of a notion that it's a free flowing obligation. It's a good faith obligation to comply with UNDRIP where possible. And what this legislation has done is said, no, there's actually a statutory duty now upon the government of Canada and all its departments to consult and cooperate with Indigenous people to ensure that all laws are consistent with the declaration. And that would include uh, these amendments to, uh, to the Environmental Protection Act that have come in under S5. So to aid us in our statutory interpretation, what does that mean? What does consultation and cooperation mean? And I think we could all kind of come up with um, you know, ways to consult and ways to cooperate. And the government of Canada has, doing, has been doing a great job with that for years with stakeholders. Right, all kinds of public consultation, cooperation from receiving comments on drafts to public hearings to appointing working groups. Again, stakeholder consultation and cooperation. The issue here is we're not talking about consultation and cooperation with stakeholders. This is a new way and a new consultation and cooperation level with Indigenous peoples. Next slide, please. And what does that mean then? Well, we look to the Justice of Canada website, uh, its own policy statements, and this is it needs to be a nation to nation, government to government approach for transformative change. That's a, that's a high bar. It's both a little daunting, but exciting and hopeful at the same time. But Canada also acknowledges that Indigenous, people, Indigenous peoples aren't stakeholders, you know, as, as, you, as business as usual. We have a special constitutional, constitutional relationship, high level constitutional status in this relationship. And that implementing UNDRIP will require transformative change in the government of Canada's relationship. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. You know, for the, fed for the federal government, it has acknowledged what that's gonna mean for Canada is that the responsibility includes changes the operating practices and processes of the federal government. So basically how the government of Canada, how the public service, how the bureaucracy works with Canada. Can we go back to the first slide for a second? Works with Indigenous peoples rather. So when you look at that context, that history, that status, it really puts a high duty, a high level on what will fulfill the section five requirement on consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples to the end of obtaining free prior and uh, an informed consent that laws are consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So to wrap up then, just in the context of section uh, of, um, of these amendments to the Environmental Protection Act under S5, um, the amendments originally began the legislative history in the House of Commons but died on the order paper when the House adjourned, so didn't make it uh, very far forward. Um, in June 2021 is when the, the uh, UNDRIP Implementation Act took force and effect, as I, as I mentioned. However, S5 was introduced in the Senate in February 22. So the UNDRIP Implementation Act was in full force and effect when these measures, these amendments came before the Senate. And so what we're doing now in the process, especially as Métis National Council, is saying, all right, how are we going to discharge this duty moving forward? How will the minister comply with Section 5 of the Implementation Act for UNDRIP, consulting and cooperating with Indigenous peoples, including Métis peoples, to ensure that this law, that S5, um, is consistent with UNDRIP? And I would just uh, conclude by saying I think we've heard from, from uh, Senator McCallum and from Sylvia that, well, I can say this consultation hasn't been done yet. There was a day of consultations at the Senate where Indigenous governments and representatives appeared, but that's a traditional legislative process. Here we're calling for a higher level. There's a higher mandate here for constitution and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. And so moving forward, our outstanding question is, and we're working with Canada on this currently at Métis National Council, how is this duty going to be discharged? Thank you very much for the time today. Uh, merci, and uh, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate that. Great presentation. Um, okay, so we are at two o'clock. Uh, and I did just put a little reminder in the chat that we do have uh, until 2.15 today.
So we, uh, we have some time for questions still, which is great. So at this point, I would ask um, all of our panelists and staff from SELA and Nature Canada to turn their cameras back on if they're able to, so that we can see all of you. Um, and I would invite any of our participants to share questions in the chat box. And so I know that's probably gonna take you a minute to formulate your thoughts and formulate your questions. And so thank you very much to Senator McCollum for getting us going. There's a question here in the chat from her. So we'll start with that. And Mike, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a question for you. I'll read it out for anyone who might not be looking at it. So the Senator's question is when you talk about UNDRIP and Canadian law, do you think that the scope and breadth of the articles in UNDRIP will be lessened to work within federalism? And how would that look like by using FPIC as an example? Right. And thank you for the question, uh, Senator McCallum. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I would hope not. And to us, that is the goal of Section 5. That is why all laws must conform with UNDRIP. And that is where the duty for consultation and cooperation comes in. The government has undertook this statutory commitment at law that all laws will be compliant with UNDRIP and that Indigenous peoples will be consulted and cooperate within that, within that exercise. Uh, now that now we have to, of course, make sure that happens, i.e. Bill S-5. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really an exciting time or a hopeful time because we're able to develop together what this level of consultation and cooperation will look like as it should have been done century, since centuries ago. We're at a time now where we can make that into something that's very equitable um, and, uh, and, and, and forward thinking. With regards to um, FPIC, for example, um, we at Métis National Council have been talking about FPIC and to us, that's the stuff of governments. That's the stuff of uh, indigenous governments and representative bodies. And so um, when they talk about cooperation and consultation in section five, what we're looking at is that means obtaining free prior and informed consent. And that comes from indigenous governments and um, representative bodies, because that's, that's the business that, uh, that they do representing their, their, their citizens and peoples. Thank you, Mike. And I'm wondering if uh, any of the other lawyers I know who are on the line or staff from SELA or Nature Canada wanted to weigh in on that question at all. Um, Mike, uh, I just had a quick question for you. Um, your views on, and I think it was implicit in Senator McCallum's question, uh, does UNDRIP purport to apply to provincial governments or provincial legislatures? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it says the laws of Canada. So we've been engaging the government of Canada so far. Uh, that's a question that we'd have to look at more. And I will be able to get back to you on that if that, uh, that's acceptable. Of course. Thank you. I don't want to lean too far forward uh, just yet as legal advisor. Mark, I see you're unmuted. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, this question for Mike or, or any other panelists, and maybe I can actually slip in two questions. Um, I, it is surprising, you know, given the passage of the UNDRIP Act, how little Bill S-5 makes reference to UNDRIP. And I guess if it wasn't for that addition added in the Senate, there would be no reference, if I'm correct. Has any other act passed since the UNDRIP Act passed uh, or introduced, any other act introduced, done a better job? And if you have time, as you may know, uh, Nature Canada is particularly interested in uh, part six of SEPA, which regulates genetically engineered organisms. And uh, there's an intersection in particular with indigenous rights when it comes to species of traditional importance like Atlantic salmon. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, thanks for the question, Mark. And again, it goes back to uh, us being grateful for this opportunity to bring to people's attention the obligations, the sexual obligations under Section 5 of Under Implementation Act, um, which we're, we're uh, trying at, at every opportunity to, <laughs> to get out, uh, out there. Uh, there have been legislative initiatives, of course, since uh, June 21st, 2021. 
Um, right now, we're doing uh, our best to meet with government departments who have legislation in the pipe at various stages. Uh, we get reactions from uh, folks not knowing this was a requirement, which we can understand to an extent. Public servants are, are busy and overworked. However, it is a statutory obligation, which compliance is required at law. And we stand ready to help with that uh, to make sure that that compliance is done and to shape what the duty under Section 5 will look like. Uh, Justice Canada has issued a guidance document to its departments on the, you know, the emerging standards under Section 5. So we're kind of between the two poles of that spectrum, if you will. You know, Justice has issued gui uh, guidance. We have an ongoing discussion with the Department of Justice on Section 5, what needs to take place, how it needs to look. And then we have still have it percolating its way down throughout the bureaucracy um, and having those discussions on, okay, if we're this far along, how does it look? What are we going to do to comply? Um, and I would leave specific questions on, on the salmon fishery to my, to my uh, far more knowledgeable colleagues on the panel. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, we too are, are very concerned about the uh, the franken fish known as the the, the aqua bounty uh, salmon. Um, it, it it's something that um, that uh, we've been engaged with uh, with uh, organizations questioning uh, and and uh, 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 you know, opposing uh, the, uh, the 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 process, if you would call it, about by, by which uh, the government uh, assessed that species uh, to be. Um, uh, to be uh, accepted, and and that went through a, a weird, in my mind, a very weird process uh, because SEPA, you know, was uh, is is a, I mean, in my mind, is a chemicals management oriented, and this uh, this biotechnology thing was sort of uh, uh, slapped on in in, in '99, uh, but um, uh, you know, that's uh, I, I don't think it's adequate. Uh, at all for assessing uh, biotechnology. I mean, we're talking organisms, you know, we're living things. Um, and uh, but throughout that entire uh, time, uh, that when we became aware of it, and and, and we raised uh, serious questions to DFO, Health Canada, uh, you know, the the at the national or at the. Um, the, the the international um, uh, NASCO the, the Atlantic Salmon Conservation or Organization, um, you know, never once were we actually truly engaged by the government of Canada to uh, to to really seek uh, 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 you know uh, our our, uh, our our consent. Uh, it was it, it's it's always been a matter of you know well here's some information but. You know, it doesn't really matter what you say. They're going to make the determination that they're going to make. Um, so I, I, I really hope that either one of two things: either that Section Six be greatly expanded and really, you know, put some some good uh, uh, mechanisms uh, in it uh, in order to be able to do an appropriate assessment, or 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 we come up with uh, something uh, all altogether different, uh, because um, it's it's not been a, a good uh, uh, we've not had any effect uh, on. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 decision uh, that uh, the government of Canada came up with uh, in, in approving that uh, that GMO and you know there's that's just one fish uh, I and mean, there's many many others uh, uh, to uh, that uh, the government is looking at so. Hi, can I uh, say something here? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, um, I wanted to, um, when, when you look at UNDRIP, there's still great hesitation in Senate to, to, um, to have, you know, for senators to, to see that they had passed this action plan, but they continue as if it never happened. And I think with, that passing of the um, the action plan, I don't know why they had to pass pass the action plan when Canadians got their human rights. They didn't go through an action plan. They were given 
their rights. I mean, we always had them. We have them. Why do we need someone to say, well, let's see what, what we're going to do with them. So that's why I asked that question. If they're not going to uh, acknowledge that we have all those rights already, that they are inherent rights, does that mean that right now we don't have any human rights? Like, and if different groups say, well, this is my version, this is my version, there's going to be a patchwork of, of under throughout Canada. And how is that going to be dealt with, you know? And when we did um, S5, and I asked to pull out free prior and informed consent in the preamble, it's in the preamble. When I asked that to be pulled out, there was a you know there was hesitation on the part of the 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 members of energy committee to even acknowledge that and i said this is such a fundamental part of our right it needs to be you know to be highlighted and it passed but it doesn't mean that the house of commons is going to leave it there and um and you know, and the interjurisdictional gaps that fall. There are interjurisdictional gaps because this is federal legislation, and the province has uh, natural resources, and that's where the difficulty comes in. Is how do we handle? How do we work with those interjurisdictional gaps? Because that's where our people fall in. That it's in those gaps that we are vulnerable. And there's no need for that to happen, but it's been very difficult to try and get the province, you know, who are butting heads with First Nations, you know, to come to the table and do what needs to be done. So we have a lot of, of um, work to do. And I'm just, um, I guess, asking the people that are listening, if you have any ideas, could you please um, uh, con contact us at our office in Senate. And James, I'll get James to put our, our, uh, our information. And um, if there's any way that we could help you with the work that you do, then please contact us, okay? And that is how we, we start connecting with people across Canada. And that is how I think we need to to work all together, okay? And so thank you. Thank you so much, Senator McCollum. It was well said. Um, I, I do see another question in the chat box, but I'm aware that it's 2.13 and in reading the question, I'm not sure it's one we can answer briefly. So I might invite any of our speakers or staff if you wanted to weigh in on that in the chat box while we wrap up, um, as opposed to, I just wanna be really respectful of the time that our panelists have already given us today. Um, so with that, are there any last comments that any of our panelists or staff want to share before we do our closing remarks? Okay. Um, Faye, did you have any closing remarks you want to share before I talk about the survey and the next steps from here? Or, uh, sorry, you probably want to tell people about the next webinar. I almost um, well, yes. Um, so thank you, April. Um, I do think that last question is a really important piece because I think um, so maybe we follow up with the person who's uh, submitted that question directly with the panelists. Um, I do want to thank everyone in terms of uh, the panelists, particularly in terms of engaging us on this very important issue. Um, we do have Nature Canada, Sila has a final uh, webinar that's set for next week, October 26th. Hope you are able to join us. It'll be focused on, on issues relating to um, uh, GMOs, uh, biotechnology products, uh, 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 living organisms, um, and electromagnetic frequency, and with the possibility of expanding that. Um, so I hope you're able to join us um, for that webinar next week. And I'll leave it to you, April. Great. Thank you, Faye. Um, so yes, the link that was shared a couple of times to the um, Sorry, I'm trying to read the chat and speak at the same time, and I should know better than to try and do that. So we shared a link to the event page for today's webinar series. If you go in there and scroll down to webinar four, you'll see a registration link for next week. We encourage you to join us there. 
And then also I'm just going to share the survey link. This should pop up when you sign off the webinar, but just in case it doesn't, I'm gonna put it in here. If you could please take a moment to do that. Um, and yes, so we will circulate an email in the next day or so that has the recording, that has the links from today's chat box, and we can also include contact information for any of our panelists who would like us to do that. So it sounds like Senator McCollum, you'd like some contact information included there, we can do that. Um, and we'll share that, that question that you've requested as well. So with that, I want to say thank you so much to our panelists today for giving us their time. I know how busy um, you are and how many demands there are in your time. So we're grateful for you for sharing um, your perspectives and your experience today. Um, and thanks to the staff for organizing today's session and to all of our participants for listening uh, and participating. And hopefully we'll see many of you next week. With that, I will say thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.